And speaking in a loud voice, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Hebrews 10.10 says, For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ once for, <clears throat> once for all time. So this morning, remember Jesus. Remember that I made you. You are mine. Remember that through every act of your rebellion, I will work to draw you to myself. Remember that not long after you shouted, Crucify! I shouted, it is finished. My work of redemption complete sin was finished that day as I broke as I broke its hold on you with my life. Remember my body, broken, torn, battered, and bruised for you. Remember my blood poured freely for you. Remember when you proclaim my death for you, you proclaim redemption through me alone. Remember that I am coming back soon for my bride, my bride that I have washed white, pure, spotless by my blood. Remember that every time you take this bread and drink this cup, remember me. First Corinthians 9, 24 uh, through 27 says this. Do not know that those who run in a race all run. He competes in the games, exercises self-control in all things, and they do it to receive a perishable wreath. We, an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim, and I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified. And today, for the next 40, 45 minutes, hour, hour and a half, however long I go, we'll see. Um, Cindy gave me the okay, so if I go long, it's on her. So you, can, you, can, you can hold her accountable. Um, but it, I just want to go through Paul's couple verses here, and we're just going to take some tips from him, because I think he's more of an authority on this than I am. So I'm just going to stick with what he teaches us. All right, And um, we're going to talk about how faithful Christians finish the race. Right, And so my proposition, we're going to have a few points here. That faithful Christians who finish the race, just like we want to do, faithful Christians will do these things. Number one, they'll have their eyes on the prize, and they won't look back. Number two, they'll train hard. They will constantly train and avoid stagnation. They'll drop dead weight. They'll be willing to have a fashion change. They'll diet. They'll run with teammates, and they'll embrace the race. And I tell you what, I can't explain to you how hard it was to stay on theme. I put a lot of thought into these goofy little sayings. It's hard to be creative, I tell you what, it's, it's, not, it's not a joke. But um, faithful Christians will do these things. And most importantly, none of these things matter if we don't understand the importance of the race. And so as we go through these things today, uh, I pray that uh, they can be beneficial to you. And so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, we... Uh, just humbly come before you, God, and we are so grateful for the race that, that is before us, God. And Father, we know that baptism, Father, was just the start, God, and we know the the intensity of the race set before us, God. We know that the gates are narrow and, and few will find the way, God. And Father, everyone in this building here in, in our congregation today, God, I pray that we are part of those few who find the gates, God. And Father, we just ask that you be with us today as we look intently into your word, Father, and Father, just try to glean some information from some of the, the righteous information, Father, from your scriptures and apply it to our lives, God. We uh, are so grateful for the truth of the, the gospel message and for the scriptures that we have. And Father, we're grateful for the Holy Spirit that helps guide us, Father, on this race. Father, we love you so much and thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So number one, the faithful Christian who finishes the race will understand the importance of the race. We read it already, verse 25, it says, They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. See, Paul understood what he was racing for. The worldly people, they just want that, that materialistic whatever it may be. But us, the imperishable wreath, the crown of righteousness that we'll read, that we receive the day we die when we go into heaven. 
And I want to submit to you this morning that if we understand that, that is half the battle, right? Because importance determines effort. If you were here earlier for Sunday school, you heard Chuck kind of allude to that, that we, the way we understand things. If something is important to us, that's where we put our priorities. Right? And if we understand the importance of this race, the implications that we have, that will determine our effort in this race. And so, LeBron James, right? The way I thought of it was this. If Donald Trump, LeBron James, and I are hanging out one day, and Donald Trump, because he's a billionaire, says, you know what, Blake, I will give you a billion dollars if you beat LeBron James in a 20-yard dash. I'm going to look at LeBron James and go, that's a freak of a man right there. And I'm going to look at me and, probably not, right? Right? But if you compare that athlete to me, for a billion dollars, I'm going to sell out. I'm going to give it everything I got because that billion dollars is worth something to me. There's importance to that, so I'm going to try my best. Now, if you compare that to Donald Trump saying, I'm going to give you a piece of candy if you win this race, Blake. You just get one Hershey's kiss. That's all you get if you beat him. Beat this world champion athlete. All you, all you get is a, is a Hershey's kiss. Well, what's the point? Right? I know I'm going to get dusted by this guy. I'm not going to try very hard. right? So we have to understand what we're fighting for. Are, are we running this race for a piece of candy? Or are we running this race for a billion dollars? And so 2 Timothy 4, through 7, 4, 7 through 8 tells us what a billion dollars is. It says, I have fought the good fight, and I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have, have loved his appearing. And I think it's pretty obvious what we're running for, right? We are running to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. And, and I think that when you've been in the congregation, when you've been a believer for as long as some of us have, I pray that never loses its impact, but it's easy to, right? We say, oh, we're going to heaven with Jesus. But do we really think about what that means? And I thought about this, and Luis and I have talked about it, and when we think about eternity, if you ever dwell on eternity, does it make your brain hurt to think about how long eternity truly is? I, I, th I think about everything in life, in our worldly life that we live now, everything comes to an end, right? Our favorite movies, our favorite books, right? Childhood came to an end. High school came to an end. Singlehood came to an end. Time before kids came to an end, right? All, everything we know, this life is finite. There is an end to it. But eternity, there is no end. And that's what we are racing for. I, I've, I've heard it explained once that if I were to take a rope from me and, and the rope stretched all the way to the glass there, the other end, that's eternity. And our life on this earth is this far. It goes this far. That is eternity. And our brains, we can't comprehend that because we are not God. We have a finite understanding of time. But with God, there is no time. We will spend that entire eternity with Him. And when we understand that, we're going to put in the effort, right? And I tell you what, Satan does not want us to understand the importance of that. He is attacking what happens when we die. Right? When we talk to people in the world, they think when we die, that's it. It's done. You know, there's, there's nothing else after death. Satan wins if we believe that, brothers and sisters, because there's no consequences for our life and our actions in this world. And he wants us to believe, he wants every single one of us to believe that all we're running for is that Hershey's kiss. He wants us to think we are running for something so insignificant. Why sacrifice our, our time, our money, our effort, everything? Why do it for Hershey's kiss? No, we are running for eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven. And we need to understand that. 2 Timothy 2.5 says, Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. And I throw this in there just to make the point that perseverance of the saints 
is a salvational issue and that there are terms for how we run this race laid out in the scriptures and that we have to stay in his faith and in his grace to get that prize at the end of the race. And a big part of that is that this race that we're running is a solo mission, right? And we know that everyone is accountable for his own deeds and that we can't piggyback off our spouse, off our parents, off anyone we might in this life. We are the ones who have to be willing to run this race and live according to the rules if we want to reach the prize at the end. So number two, the faithful Christian who finishes the race will keep his eyes on the prize and not look back. Verse 26, as we go back to our main text, it says, Therefore, run in such a way as not without aim, and I box in such a way as not beating the air. So, now that we understand the importance of this race that we're running, do we have our eyes constantly set on that finish line? We know why we want to get to the finish line, but are we intently gazing, doing everything we can, eyes fixed on that, on that red tape that we're going to run through at the end, right? Is our mind intent on that? And I want to submit to you today that we might know the importance of the finish line, but if our eyes are not fixed, we will not find our destination, brothers and sisters. We will not find it. Luke 14, 28, Jesus gives the, uh, the parable of a man who starts the project without counting the cost. Right? We can't run a race without knowing where we're going. In work, in life, you never start something without knowing why you're doing it. And in work, every project you have, you have goals to meet that project, the final goal. And so as we live our lives, we need to have our eyes fixed on that finish line. And, and when I think about this, having our eyes fixed on that finish line isn't enough. We need to have the purpose of getting to that finish line. The purpose, along with that fixed gaze, is what is essential for us. And it's funny, in uh, lecture this past week at D school, my professor used this example. And uh, I was like, wow, he's just giving me sermon points. This guy had no idea what he was doing for me today, but he gave me this. He told us a story. He said um, they were doing construction in his neighborhood, and they were building more houses in the neighborhood. And as he was walking along, he came upon three guys working on putting up the walls of the house. And the, the three guys are there laying brick. They're working out in the hot over the summer. And, and he went to the first guy and said, what are you guys doing? First guy says, oh, we're just laying bricks. We're just putting up a wall. Okay. Goes on to the second guy. He says, what are you guys doing here? Oh, we're building a house. Goes to the third guy. He says, what are you doing here? The third guy knew his purpose. He said, I'm building a home for a young family, for a young married couple and their kids. Right? The first two guys, they had a task that they were working on, right? But the third had purpose. He knew why he was slaving away, laying those bricks piece by piece, sweating in that 100 degree heat. He had purpose. And brothers and sisters, we need aim and we need purpose in this life because everything is easier when we have purpose. I think if we compare those three people, the one who's just laying a wall, he's not invested in what he's doing. When, when struggles come, when he's having a rough day at work, he's gonna give up, because why? It's just a job, right? But that third man, there's a reason why he's willing to, to slave out there, to lay brick by brick, to sweat, and to give all he has for that family. And so, brothers and sisters, we understand that having purpose is meaningful when we look at it that way. And so the question is, do we have purpose in our lives? Are we living day by day in the faith with purpose? And not only that, do we need our aim fixed forward, but we can't look back. Philippians 3, 13 and 14 says, less likely to lose our way on the path. I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize. And, and I think this is a spot on analysis of the struggles we have with setting our gaze on that finish line. It's because we all have 
rough pasts. We all have a past before we encounter Jesus Christ. Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we know that the wages of sin is death. And it's easy to harp on that. We all come from different paths and may have different varies of the struggles that we went through. And, and I've found that the harder our life has been, the easier it is to dwell on that past. Right? But if we spend all our time focused looking backwards, thinking about our past and where we've come from, our eyes aren't fixed forward. Our eyes aren't on that finish line. You can't look forward and backwards at the same time. I mean, I, my neck doesn't work that way. I don't know if, if you guys have that ability. But, but we cannot serve two masters. We can't focus on the past while we'll be dwelling on the future and, and having purpose in everything we do. And, and the difference now that we have the blessing of in our new life with Christ is that our sins have been forgiven as far as the East is from the West. We have no reason, no reason to dwell on our past because we know Christ certainly isn't. We know that we are clothed with Christ and that we are a new creation. And so instead of looking backwards, we need to be looking forwards. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. And see... When our mind is set forward, when we're thinking constantly of the things above, we can't think of the things of the earth, right? If, if we wholeheartedly are in the scriptures every single day, pondering the righteous thoughts of God, pondering the scriptures, we have nothing to look back to. Our minds are occupied, and we need our minds to be occupied, brothers and sisters, because we're only human and we're going to fall and look back, right? But we need to minimize that by thinking on the things of, of heaven, thinking on the things above. And so number, what are we on? Number three, I got so many I can't keep track. Uh, number three, the faithful Christian who finishes the race will train hard. Verse 25, it says, Everyone who competes in the game exercises self-control in all things. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that I, after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. The, the, the part that I hone in on is becoming a forgetful hearer rather than an effectual doer. And I think that's a very potent point. And I think the, the thing that needs to be said is that humans are dumb. We are dumb creatures. And if we are not intently, constantly looking at the scriptures, we will become forgetful hearers. It's human nature to strive and fall away. If we are not constantly doing something, we will fall away from that pattern and go away from it. I think of Ryan and Abby, and every, every kid example I have is of Ryan and Abby, if, if you'll figure it out, because I don't have kids yet. So Ryan and Abby, right, last time we were at their house, Zane and Xander are learning to walk and, and, and run everywhere. So, dangerous place, the steps, right? When I was there for two hours, she told that boy, those boys, to get off the steps at least 10 times. They start climbing. Oh, Zane, Zane, no, you're not allowed on the steps. Get down. Five minutes later, I hear it. Zane, get, get off the steps. Someone go get him. Someone go get him, right? Kids will forget like that, that they've been told not to do something. And that does not change as we age, brothers and sisters. We are still that same person when we get older. And if we, as adults, are not in the scriptures, constantly being reminded to stay away from certain things, to stay away from the lust of the flesh, and to go to things that are holy and righteous, we're going to forget. We need that constant reminder. And instead of mom and dad on this earth teaching us, we need our Father in heaven through the scriptures to keep on reminding us. And that's on us to open up the word and spend the time doing it. Aristotle said this, you are what you repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence is a habit. And so from that mindset, 
if we do not make studying the scriptures, assembling with the brethren, prayer, a habit, we will become forgetful hearers. And then therefore we cannot be effectual doers in the kingdom. And to further illustrate this, I think about the flip side of Ryan and Abby and their kids, right? When I'm over at their house, in the chaos that is, those four boys running around the house, right? I get caught up in this whirlwind of just little kids running around me, loud, right? And I get, I get a little disoriented, right? I was, I don't, I'm not around kids very often, except for at their house. So I get caught in that whirlwind, right? But then I look at Ryan and Abby, and they are cool, calm, and collected, right? Because they are in that every single day. They are in the storm every single day. Right? We know that James 1, 2 through 4 says suffering produces endurance and makes us complete. They learn patience dealing with those four boys, chasing them up and down the steps every single day. Right? And I don't have to do that. They have been made complete in their patience. Obviously not made complete, but they are closer to being complete in their patience than I am because they are in the trenches with those kids every single day, and I'm not. We are what we repeatedly do. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and Chuck's favorite, self-control, are therefore habits. And we must make them habits. We must be committed to studying the scriptures and assembling with the brethren and prayer because those things will help us make the fruits of the Spirit habit. And on the flip side of that, we have to avoid stagnation when we're training hard. Right? We all know that life, this race that we run, is not a sprint. And that we all have the hills and valleys in our faith. We all have them. And, and if we, we say we don't, we are liars. We all have them. And we're all going to stumble. We're all going to fall down on this race. And that is okay. I do not want to come across as saying that is not okay. And that we have to press on, press on, press on. That should be our goal. But we are humans. We live in the flesh. And we are going to stumble. But what is not okay, as we're going to read here, is to stay down, to be defeated, to become stagnant, to slow down, right? Because God hates stagnation. If you read all of Revelation 3, which we don't have time to do today, you'll see that God hates stagnation. He goes through the letters to all the churches, and he talks about their deeds. And the most potent one for me is this one here on the bottom. It says, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Brethren, as we, as we keep going on this race, we have to train hard and avoid stagnation. I never want that to be said about me. I want it to be said about anyone in this congregation because I want to be in eternity in paradise with every single one of you. And we cannot allow this to happen. And if we are constantly training, if we make excellence, if we make the fruits of the Spirit a habit, we don't have to worry about this issue. We know that when we fall down, those fruits of the Spirit, our brothers and sisters in Christ that are faithful to the assembly that we allow to encourage one another are going to pick us up and help us get back on track so that this is never said about us. And when I think about those old salt and pepper people, right? We know that they have fallen down many times, but they have gotten back up every single time. They have endured the struggles because they have been constantly trained. They have built up that endurance so that when those storms come, when they fall, they've been able to get back up, and now they're near the finish line. And I can't wait to be at that point. I hope, I hope you guys are the same way, where you are ready, because you've conquered the trials. You've avoided stagnation. You've pressed onto that finish line, and you're just right there at the finish line. And brothers and sisters, we're going to stumble and fall, and I can't emphasize this enough, but we have to keep moving forward. We have to. And if we love Jesus, if we understand what Jesus did for us and the importance of the race that we're running as we kind of go back, 
then we are going to abhor stagnation ourselves. And we are going to be despised if we catch ourselves backpedaling. Right? So let's avoid that. Number four, faithful Christians who finish the race will drop dead weight. The very first verse in 24, it said, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Therefore, run in such a way that you may win. And when we think about this verse, running in a way that we may win, the example is, I want to run the race and win. I want to be as fast as humanly possible. I don't want anything slowing us down. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Therefore, since we have a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. And first, notice that our eyes, again, fixed on Jesus. I got a little recurring pattern there if we can't figure that one out. Right? We see that, but also that dead weight that we need to be willing to get rid of. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us so that we can run the race with endurance. And, and as we analyze this and how we're going to do that and how we're going to drop the dead weight and run faster, I thought of two things that really will slow us down in this life. We have internal weight and we have external weight. And we'll see what that means in a second. But we have to be willing to cut these encumbrances that entangle us and slow us down. Because if we care about the prize, we care about the end of the race, we don't want anything to get in our way and slow us down from getting there. And I will admit that cutting this weight can be painful. And so with that in mind, our external weight that we need to cut is our clothing, right? I, I don't, does anyone actually know who this is? Okay, so I'm not crazy. I, okay, all right. So, right? We have right here a very, very thin woman. She doesn't have much weight to slow her down. But that coat, I think that's going to have some drag resistance on it. I think that's going to that's probably weighs as much as her, right? She has to be willing to get rid of that external weight, and that's not her, if she wants to run this race fast. And so she needs a fashion change. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33 and 34 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought, and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. And I don't think this verse needs an explanation. right? That external weight that we let drag us down is the people that we choose to surround ourselves with. And, and we all know the person, we can think of a person right now in our minds at work or at school, someone we interact with in our daily lives, that is just a vile human being. That is just sinful and worldly and just wears on your spirit. And we would love to cut them out of our lives. And we'd be like, oh yeah, that's easy. Jesus, you're telling me to cut these people out of our lives? Bam. No problem. Done. But this verse isn't talking about those people. It's talking about the people we consider to be friends. It's the people we let in close to our lives that are sinful, worldly people. Because we know that the people we associate with, the people we spend time with, have a profound impact on who we are. And when we allow that bad company to corrupt our good morals because we let people in close to us who we probably shouldn't, they're going to wear on our spirit. And you might be saying to me, Blake, we're supposed to evangelize to the sinners of the world because we were once sinners. And yes, we are. Right? But we need to be careful and purposeful when we go out and evangelize to the world. Because just as much as we like to think we have an impact on the worldly people, that we're bringing the light of Jesus to them, 
they are also having an effect on us if we are not careful. And so brothers and sisters, we have to be willing to cut that out of our lives if we want to run this race uncumbered and run it as quickly as we can. And the other thing we have to do is get rid of some of that internal weight and some of our extra poundage that we carry ourselves. Right? We have to be willing to diet. Galatians 5, 7 says, You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? And I think, one, this emphasizes my point that bad company corrupts good morals, yes, but we choose to allow that bad company to corrupt us. We choose to allow the people around us that are going to wear on our spirits. And also, we choose to allow the idols that we have in our life, that extra poundage that we carry ourselves. No one else has anything to do with the idols that we have in our own life. We have to be willing to cut those pounds, to cut those idols out of our life. And I, I think about, because it's, well, we're in February now, we're not in January anymore. But we think about January 1st, what's everyone's, everyone's resolution? They gotta lose weight, right? Everyone says they gotta lose those pounds, right? And so if I said to all of you today, you're gonna start a diet, and you're gonna lose weight, and you have to cut out all these sweets and the fats and, and all this gooey stuff in here, right? We gotta get out of the, we gotta get the chocolate away from Louisa, right? We know that's her thing, right? And if everyone is reflective of that, and for me, it's brownies, I'm not just picking on you, sweetie, right? <laughs> for me, it's brownies, but if, if I said you have to cut weight, everyone in your mind right now, can think of the one thing that they cannot have in that house, right? All you might go, mm, you know what? Yeah, I cannot have donuts in this house if I'm gonna lose weight because I'm gonna give in, right? I can control myself around salty stuff. I don't need fast food, I don't need soda, but I need them donuts, right? We all have that in our life, that food right now that we can think of. And so if we're being reflective now, we all have that idol in our life that we can think of right now that we know we will always give into. And it's different for every single one of us. You know, um, whether it's football, whether it's sports, the love of money, work, we can make our kids idols if we're not careful, drugs, alcohol, anything that makes us not sober-minded, right? All of these things, anything that we put in front of God that holds us back from serving his kingdom, from growing in the faith day by day, is an idol. And we need to be wary of that. And we need to be able to be self-reflective. And I challenge you all, as you leave today, to be self-reflective and think about what these idols are in your own life that are slowing you down in this race. Because anything that takes our focus away from having our mind set on the things above is an idol. And we need to be willing to remove it, brothers and sisters. We have to be able to move it. And I know it's hard. And I know it's hard. But I would encourage each and every one of us today to try and cut the dead weight. To just try it and see how fast you'll run. See how on fire you will feel without these things slowing you down. And you'll, you'll feel on fire in the faith and you'll get to that high point, right? And, and once we get to that point, we just gotta keep it going. But the first step is removing this dead weight from our lives. Point number five, the faithful Christian who finishes the race will run with teammates. And I like to think this is pretty self-explanatory as well, right? It's the opposite of bad company. We want to remove the dead weight and replace it with our teammates who are going to build us up every single day, right? We need constant encouragement. We need Abby constantly telling us to stay away from the steps, right? We need that. We need our brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage us, to come alongside us and run this journey with us, right? That's why we have the assembly. What? Right? Hebrews 10.25. I'll go back to Chuck because he loves this verse. Being faithful to the assembling together of ourselves, right? We have a congregation, a body of believers 
because we need it. We need the encouragement of the saints to spur us on to good works, right? We know that Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron, so one man also sharpens another. And Ecclesiastes 4, 12, if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist, and a cord of three strands is not easily broken, right? There's a reason we have this assembly, and I'm going to challenge every single one of us to be faithful to the assembly, to run with the teammates every single Lord's Day, to meet around his table, to hear the word proclaimed, and to pray with the congregation, right? Because there's no place like the assembly of the saints. There is no other thing, no other institution on this earth like it, where you have a group of people who believe the same thing as you, who are on the same exact mission as you, struggling just like you are, going on highs just like you are. They have their highs and their lows. And when we have our lows, we know they're going to suffer with us. And we have our highs, we know they're going to rejoice with us. There's nothing like this on this earth except for marriage. And the difference between the assembly and marriage is that our marriage is every single day. Right? I am lucky enough to have a hype man that I live with every single day who's going to encourage me and spur me on to good works in the Lord. Right? The whole institution of marriage, when we think about it, when we look at it, was designed to have a helpmate in this life and to get one another to heaven together. And brothers and sisters, if we, are, if we have the privilege of being married today, we need to ask ourselves, are we being our spouse's hype man? Are we constantly building them up, encouraging them to good works? Because that's, that's why we're married. It's not to fulfill our own selfish lusts or to help pay the bills or whatever, you know, to have a sugar mama, sugar daddy. No, it's there to help spur one another to, to good works, to finish this race like we ought to so we can win that prize together. And my last point is this. Faithful Christians who finish the race and get the prize embrace the race. Matthew 20, Jesus gives the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. And instead of reading it, I'll just summarize. Sunrise hits, the, the vineyard owner goes out and he hires a bunch of workers and says, I'm going to pay you $10. They work all day. They slave out in the hot sun. And then with two hours left in the workday, he goes and hires a few more workers. And at the end of the day, he pays them $10 as well. Right? Both got $10, but one group worked very much less for it. Right? And we know Jesus taught us this parable for us to understand that everyone receives the Holy Spirit when they're baptized, and if they run the race with faithfulness, no matter how long that race is, whether it's a day or 60 years, that they get to go to heaven and share in that prize. But what I want to focus on in this is that when they received their pay at the end of the day, the group who had worked all day in the fields was angry. They were upset that their labor was worth the same as someone who worked two hours. And the problem with that is, is that they didn't embrace the race. They didn't enjoy the work that they were doing for the king. They didn't have that mindset, right? We understand the purpose. We have our eyes fixed on that finish line. And that's easy to do, but what's hard to do is embrace the struggle it takes to get there. Instead of being upset that they got paid the same amount for working X amount of hours longer, we need to be thankful that we had the ability to work in God's fields, right? If we, every single day in our lives, embrace the struggle, embrace the tears and the time that we give to the kingdom, all our money, all our effort, our blood, sweat, and tears, instead of being upset about that, we need to be thankful that we have the privilege of doing the Lord's work on this earth. And if we have that mindset, if we can truly believe that, that we are blessed to be a privilege to serve, to be God's hands and feet, when we truly think about that and believe that, this life's going to get a lot easier, brothers and sisters. When we go through struggles, 
will consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. See, when we consider it all joy, when we get out of breath on this race, when we're tired, when our legs, we feel like our legs are going to give out from under us, we consider it all joy that we're able to run this race and we can do it with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We do it with the Holy Spirit so that we can be with Jesus one day. If we can truly buy into that belief, this life will get a lot easier. I promise you that. And it will have its perfect result. And so in conclusion, we'll recap. Faithful Christians who finish the race and win the prize understand the importance of the race. They constantly have their eyes on the prize and they don't look back. They train hard constantly. They avoid stagnation. They're willing to drop dead weight through their clothes or through what they eat. They run with the teammates and they embrace the race. And brothers and sisters, as we leave here today, my prayer is that we can apply this to our lives. Because we all know, everyone in here can raise their hand and tell me a story about how tough this life is, how hard this battle with the flesh is, and we know that we're going to have to endure it until the day we die. But we also know that it's so worth it when we get there. That everything we will endure in this life, we will be rewarded for tenfold on the day that we meet Jesus. And, and as I, I close, I just want to end with, when we do these things, if we can apply these to our lives and be faithful Christians to the end, that we will one day hear and be able to say to ourselves that I have finished the race, I have fought the good fight, and finished the course, and then Jesus will turn and say to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we uh, just just humbly come before you, God, and we just love you so much, God. And Father, we know that you loved us. Father, you sent your only son to die for us because you loved us and want to spend eternity with us, God, in, in paradise. And Father, we know that your work has been done, Father, through Jesus on the cross and that your, your side of the covenant has been upheld and will continue to be upheld and that you will never fail us, you will never give up on us, God. And Father, we know that the race ahead of us is solely on ourselves, God. And Father, I pray that you give us the endurance to run this race, God, that you give us the courage and the boldness and the desire to cut out idols from our life, God, to, to be willing to discipline ourselves and make it a slave, our body a slave, God, because we know that those things produce endurance and have a perfect outcome, Father. Father God, we just love you so much, and we cannot wait to spend eternity with you, God. And Father, until that day comes, God, I just pray that each and every one of us, God, can be wholly devoted to you, Father, and embrace the race that we have, God, and enjoy the work in your kingdom here in Harrisonburg, God, that we can truly enjoy it. And Father, that we can go out and share the gospel message, Father, this truth, this truth of the race, the truth that Jesus Christ loved us and sacrificed himself on the cross for us, Father, that we can bring others along on this race with us. God, it's, it's selfish to know this message, Father, to run this race alone and not tell anyone else about it, to not try and bring others with us along on this path, God. And Father, we do all of this, Father, because we love you and we love Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.